SP1. SP1 contains four core practicals, so it's very important that you understand all the core practicals because it, it will be at least 15% of your exam marks. The first practical involves microscopes and this practical you need to understand how to prepare slides, how to produce labeled scientific drawings, you need to understand the setup of a light microscope and you need to also understand how to identify structures. You may also be asked to do magnification calculations. First of all, a microscope is an instrument used to magnify an, an object. This is done using both the eyepiece lens and the objective lens. There is also a focusing wheel that adjusts the focus to make images clearer. This is called a light microscope because light passes through the specimen to magnify the image. To use a microscope, you need to first start with the lowest objective lens. After you've used the lowest objective lens, you need to use the focusing wheel to make your image clearer. If the image isn't big enough, you can then magnify it by using a larger objective lens. So just to recap, start with the lowest objective lens to find the specimen. This also makes sure that you doesn't damage the high objective lens. Use the focusing wheel to focus the image clearer. And then finally, use a higher objective lens to increase the magnification. If you want to work out the magnification of a microscope, remember you're using two different lenses that magnify the image. So the total magnification is the eyepiece lens magnification times the objective lens magnification. For example, if the eyepiece lens magnification is times 10, and you're using the red objective lens, which is times 4, then it's just 10 times 4, which is 40. So you're seeing an image 40 times larger than in real life using the microscope. Sometimes you might get an image that's a picture. In this case, you're not looking at a microscope, so this image might be bigger than real life. So again, you can work out the magnification. However, instead of using the total magnification calculation equation, you use the IM formula. And here, the I stands for image size, A stands for actual size, and M is magnification. If you want to work out the image size, is the actual size times the magnification. To work out the actual size is image size divided by magnification. And then to work out magnification is image size divided by actual size. When doing the IM formula calculations, you need to understand units in case you need to convert them. So first of all, one meter is a thousand millimeters. If you want to convert millimeters back to meter, you divide it by a thousand. And then one millimeter equals a thousand micrometers and again to convert micrometers back to millimeters you have to divide it by a thousand. Notice that to convert from a larger unit to a smaller unit you multiply and then to convert from a smaller unit to a larger unit you divide. One micrometer is then a thousand nanometers and one nanometer is a thousand picometer. If you're using these standard units Notice that you only have to multiply by a thousand or divide by a thousand, and this is why I've excluded centimeters. Here's an example. So you've got an image. This image is not an image that you're looking at through a microscope. You're looking at a picture. So for the picture image, you need to use the IM formula. Here, it's already telling you that the actual size of this water flea is 700 micrometers and you're trying to work out the magnification. So how many times larger is this water flea image compared to real life? To work that out, you need to know what the image size is as well. And so you can use a ruler. When you're working on the image size, try not to measure it in centimeters, because then it doesn't follow your times thousand divided by thousand rule. So always measure using a ruler in millimeters. And now I've got 70 millimeters and I've got 700 micrometers as the actual size. You'll notice that both 
units are not the same. So it's really important to convert the larger unit into the smaller unit. This is a lot easier than doing the reverse. So when you've got this option where you have to convert units to make both units the same, always convert the largest unit to the smallest. And here you can see 70 millimeters to convert it to micrometers, I just multiply by 1000, and that's 70,000 micrometers. And then to work out the magnification, it's I divided by A, so 70,000 divided by 700, the units cancel each other out, and we're left with a magnification of times 100. This means that this water flea is 100 times larger as an image compared to real life. Just a quick recap how to do calculations using the IM formula. To work out the image size, it's actual size multiplied by magnification. Actual size is image size divided by magnification. And then magnification is image size divided by actual size. Don't forget to convert from a larger unit to a smaller unit. You have to multiply to convert from a smaller unit to a larger unit. You divide. Whenever you're measuring an image, always measure in millimeters using a ruler. If the question actually gives you the measurement in centimeters, then first convert it to millimeters and then use your times thousand divide thousand rule. And when calculating magnification, make sure that the image size and the actual size are the same units. And don't forget, always convert the larger unit to the smaller unit. It's easier to multiply numbers than to divide. Sometimes you don't have to do calculations of images you can estimate and this tends to happen when you've got a scale bar so if we're estimating the size of the white blood cell we can see that the scale bar is four micrometers long and three of those scale bars fit on the width of the white blood cell so that means that is four times three 12 micrometers wide so that is an estimation I already said that magnification is how many times larger is an object compared to its actual size. Resolution is completely different. Resolution is what's the smallest distance between two points that you can see or distinguish as two separate points. For example, if you look at the two green dots, you can see them as two green dots even though they're centimeters apart. You can even see two green dots that are millimeters apart using our eyes. So our eyes has a resolution of at least millimeters. However, if we put two green dots really close to each other, we can't distinguish those dots as two separate points. So there's a limit to the resolution of our eye. So our eyes don't have a resolution lower than 100 micrometers. This is very similar for light microscopes, which have a resolution of around 100 nanometers. So to have a higher resolution, you might use an electron microscope which uses electrons to go through the specimen to build an image. The advantage of an electron microscope is not only does it provide a higher resolution magnification than a light microscope, it means that the image can be seen more detailed and clearer. In an exam question, it's important not to only mention the higher resolution and magnification part, but also to say why, so more detailed and clearer image. This means that the invention of microscopes has helped us discover a lot about cells. It means that we can understand cells in more detail and clearer in terms of their subcellular structures and this helps us to investigate the functions of those subcellular structures. So here's a six mark exam question on light and electron microscopes. How has both microscopes increased understanding of cells and functions of structures inside them? We know in light microscope we can magnify an image using light, whereas an electron, it uses electrons instead of light to magnify the image. The light microscope helps us understand cells because we can see those structures that are not visible by eye, such as the nucleus. The electron microscope has a higher magnification than the light microscope, so we can actually see much smaller objects than the light microscope. Also, it has a higher resolution, so you could see images more detailed and clearer, such as the ribosomes, which you can't see using a light microscope because it doesn't have a high enough resolution. And then don't forget to mention that resolution is the smallest distance between two points that you could distinguish as two separate points. The light microscope has, can 
help us understand the difference between animal, plant and bacterial cells. For instance, we can see that there are no nucleus in bacteria. And this means that we can investigate how specialized cells function, such as muscles, because we can see differences between cells. Because of the higher resolution and magnification electron microscope, we can also investigate the function of subcellular structures inside cells, such as how does mitochondria release energy. So that's microscopes, moving on to plant and animal cells. You could be asked in the exam to do a scientific drawing. When you're doing a scientific drawing, if all the cells are the same, you only have to draw one of the cell. Make sure you use clean unbroken lines. Don't do any sketches, shading or colouring. Draw what you see, not something you've seen in a book. So you could see in this picture of the cell, we can't see the ribosome because it doesn't have a high enough resolution. So you would not draw that in your diagram. And then make sure you add labels to the structures. The lines of, for your labels should not touch or overlap each other. You must make sure that the lines are touching the structure. If they're not touching the structure, then you are not labeling the part of the structure correctly. For core practical, you might also be asked how to prepare for slides. And the important points to make are, you can add a stain that makes structures more visible, such as the nucleus. So example would be iodine. And also, when you're preparing the slide, you should lower your cover slip slowly. And this means that there's less chance of air bubbles forming. So we need to understand the difference between animal and plant cells. So this question is compare and contrast on what is the function of the subcellular structures if you want to get higher marks. If you get a question asking about compare, compare just means state some similarities or differences. Whereas compare and contrast means you need to state similarities and differences to get the full marks. So here we've got an animal cell. And we can see an animal cell on the outside. It's got a cell membrane and that controls what substances enters and leaves the cell. We've also got a cytoplasm, and that's where most cell activities and reactions occur. And then we've got the mitochondria, which we can't see here because it's not got a high enough resolution, which means that you can use an electron microscope if you want to visually see an image of a mitochondria. And mitochondria releases energy through respiration. In a lot of exam questions, students answer and say mitochondria produces energy, but releases energy is a much better way of stating the answer. Then you've got ribosomes, again, not in a high enough resolution to see ribosomes. And ribosomes are where protein synthesis occurs. And then to finish off, you've got the nucleus, and that's where the genetic material, such as chromosomes, DNAs, are located. And this controls the cell activities. If any cell that contains a nucleus is known as a eukaryote. And this is a summary of the different subcellular structures found in animal cells. Plants have additional structures in their cells. So these additional structures include the cell wall, which is made of cellulose, and it supports and protects the cell. The chloroplast, which is the site of photosynthesis, contains chlorophyll pigments which trap energy from the sun light and then you've also got the vacuole and the vacuole contains cell stap it keeps the cell firm and rigid specialized cells here we have got human gametes otherwise known as sex cells we've got the sperm and the egg, and we need to understand how they're adapted for their specialized function. How are egg cells adapted to prevent more than one sperm entering? Egg cells have got a cell membrane and a jelly coat. Both the cell membrane and the jelly coat harden after fertilization, and this prevents the entry of additional sperms. They've also got cytoplasm that is packed with nutrients and this helps the fertilized egg grow and develop because it provides the energy. 
And then you've also got the nucleus. We know that two cells with two copies of chromosomes are called diploid. Why do human body cells contain two copies of 23 chromosomes or 46 chromosomes in total? This is because one copy of each chromosome is inherited from both parents. So for instance, if you look at chromosome 1, you'd inherited one of the chromosome 1s from your mother and you inherited another one from your father. And this is the same for every other chromosome pair. So for instance, chromosome 9, one of them you inherited from your mother, another one from your father. And that's why your body cells are diploid. However, some cells only contain one copy of every chromosome. These are known as haploid. So both the gametes in humans, the egg and the sperm, the sex cells, contain 23 chromosomes. That means they contain just one copy of every chromosome, which makes them haploid. When a sperm fertilizes an egg, the nucleus fuses together. As we said earlier, both the nucleus of the egg and the sperm contains 23 chromosomes, which is one set of chromosome. When they fuse together, we now have a fertilized egg that has got two sets of chromosomes, or two copies of every chromosome. That means the total number of chromosomes now is 46. So now, because they got two copies, after fertilization, the zygote contains 46 chromosomes. And because it contains two copies of every chromosome, it is diploid. And then through mitosis, every other body cell should also be diploid and contain 46 chromosomes. So the nucleus of gametes are haploid because they contain one set or one copy of every chromosome. Moving on to the sperm. The sperm contains enzymes called acrosomes which help break into the jelly coat and cell membrane of the egg. To help the sperm move it has lots of mitochondria that releases energy and the movement is obviously done with the tail. You also need to know other specialized cells such as microvilli epithelial cells and also the ciliate epithelial cells. When we digest food, the digested food is absorbed into the bloodstream at the small intestine. The small intestine contains microvilli that has a large surface area to increase the rate of absorption into the bloodstream. So microvilli epithelial cells have got an extension which increases surface area and this means digested food substances can be absorbed more quickly into the bloodstream. The extensions in ciliate epithelial cells are not microvilli. Instead, they are cilia and these cilia sweep sideways to move egg from ovary to uterus. Ciliate epithelial cells are also found in our throat or in the trachea and in these lining of the airways they actually do the same function where they sweep and here they sweep mucus and when they sweep mucus the mucus traps dust so the function of ciliate epithelial cells is to sweep it could either sweep the egg or it could sweep mucus and it does this using cilia So we've covered animal and plant cells. This cell here is not an animal or plant cell, it is a bacterial cell and it has very similar features to both animals and plants. It has a cell wall but not made of cellulose like in plants. It also has a cell membrane and a cytoplasm and this cytoplasm contains ribosomes so that bacteria can do protein synthesis. 
Bacteria also contain a flagellum that helps bacteria move and then it also contains plasmids and chromosomal DNA. The chromosomal DNA controls most of the cell's activities whereas the plasmid contains few of the cell's activities. So this is where the genetic material are in the bacteria. Because it's not inside the nucleus, bacteria are prokaryotes. These prokaryotic cells also do not have a mitochondria or chloroplast. So in an exam question, if they ask, what is the difference between the bacterial cell, or how can you recognize or identify the bacterial cell, the top answer is it doesn't have a nucleus, which makes it prokaryote. But alternative answers are no mitochondria and chloroplast. Note that bacteria do have ribosomes. And here's a summary of the different parts and functions of the bacteria. Now, bacteria are extremely small and sometimes you've got to deal with numbers that are extremely small or extremely large and you've got to write them in standard form. This involves having a number between 1 and 10 and multiplying it by 10 to the power of another number. Using the example we could see that we want a number between 1 and 10 here which would be 1.15. This means that I want the decimal point to be here. Currently, it is after the zero. That means it needs to be shifted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 10 to the power of 6. Looking at the bottom example, here we've got a number that is extremely small. The number between 1 and 10 is 7. So this is where the decimal point has to be and you can see that we need to shift it one two three four five six seven eight times and because they were moving towards the right direction is ten to the power of minus eight testing food is a core practical and here you need to know how to identify starch reducing sugars proteins and fats and oils otherwise known as lipids to test for starch involves using iodine. When you drop iodine, it is naturally orange color and in the presence of starch, it will turn to a blue-black color, which indicates the presence of starch. Small sugars are known as reducing sugars. And here, instead of you, you need to use a reagent called Benedict's. And this is placed in hot water such as hot water bath and this causes the reducing sugar to turn Benedict's solution from blue which is a negative result to a precipitate which is colored and different colors of the Benedict solution indicate different amounts of reducing sugar so if it turns into a green precipitate that means that there's very little sugar if the Bendix solution turns into an orange or yellow color, that means there's some more reducing sugar. And then if it's a red precipitate, that means there is lots of reducing sugar. So just a quick recap. To test for reducing sugars, you get your food, you add Benedix, and you put it into hot water, such as a hot water bath or Bunsen burner. If the blue Benedict solution, which is a negative result, turns into a red precipitate, that means there is lots of reducing sugar. To test for protein, we use the Beirut test. In the Beirut test, you add potassium hydroxide to a mixture containing your food. Then you drop copper sulfate solution. A negative result is blue color, and if it turns into purple, that means that there is protein present. So to recap, add potassium hydroxide to your food, then add copper sulfate, and if it turns purple, that means there is protein present. If it stays blue, it is a negative result. Lipids, otherwise known as fats and oils, can be tested using the ethanol emulsion test. And in this way you add ethanol, and then you have to shake your mixer and then you pour some of your mixture into water and the fats and oils or lipids that are dissolved in the ethanol will then precipitate out and form a cloudy emulsion. 
So to recap, the test for lipids is the ethanol emulsion test. You add ethanol and shake, then add it to water, and those lipids that dissolved in the ethanol will precipitate out as cloudy emulsion. Now some of these food tests indicate qualitative and some of them can provide information that is quantitative. For quantitative, we're provided information about how much of the substance there is, whereas in qualitative, it only indicates whether a substance is present or not. So for iodine solution tests, it's a qualitative test because it only tells you or indicates whether starch is present or not. And that's the same for the test for lipids using the ethanol emulsion test. However, in Bendix solution test, it is semi-quantitative because the different colored precipitate indicates different amounts of reducing sugar. So as we said earlier, a green precipitate indicates that there is little reducing sugar, an orange yellow indicates more, and a red color precipitate indicates that there are lots of reducing sugar. So this is a semi-quantitative test. The Barrett test is also semi-quantitative because the more darker the purple color, the more protein is present. And this is a summary of testing foods. If you want to do a control experiment, then you add water instead of the food and you'd expect a negative result. This proves that the food nutrient presence is changing the color of the reagent. For risk assessment, you should wear safety goggles to prevent any hot chemicals or water getting to your eyes. If they ask about risk assessment for the reducing sugar, remember you need to place your food solution and Benedict's into a hot water bath so you can wear heat resistant gloves when handling the hot equipment and this prevents burns and scalds. You must mention that the gloves are heat resistant and if you mention that it prevents burns there are additional marks. There's a really good website if you want to check someone actually doing the testing food practical and they explain each test in detail. You can also measure the amount of energy in food and this is done using a calorimeter. And in a calorimeter you are burning a food and the energy transferred from the burnt food goes into the water. And then the increase in water temperature is the amount of energy that's been released from the food. So if the temperature increases higher, that means that there is more energy in the food and a lower temperature increase means that there is less energy in the food. To reduce error so that you can increase the accuracy of your results, you should make sure that the burning food and the calorimeter are as close as possible because you want as much of the energy from the burnt food to go into the calorimeter to heat up the water instead of being lost to the surrounding. Also make sure you burn your food completely so that all the energy or as much of the energy is being transferred from the food and this increases the accuracy of the results. The function of enzymes is they are biological catalysts. This means that they speed up chemical reactions. Enzymes are made of protein molecules so that means that they are made of amino acids. Enzymes are very specific about which reactions they catalyze. Therefore, only molecules with the exactly right or specific shape bind onto the enzyme and react. And these molecules are known as substrates. The substrate has to bind onto the part of the enzyme known as the active site, which has the same specific shape as the substrate. This is like a lock and key model, where the substrate is the key, and it has to have the same specific shape as the enzyme, the lock. You can see an example here that enzyme 1 has a specific shape active site that is exactly the same specific shape as substrate 3 and that is why substrate 3 can bind onto the enzyme active site and the enzyme 1 can then catalyze the reaction. It's the same for enzyme 2, it has a different specific shape to enzyme 1 for its active site and therefore it could only catalyze 
substrate 1 which because it has the same specific shape as substrate 1. It cannot catalyze any of the other substrates because it doesn't have the same specific shape as those substrates. Those substrates will not fit into the active site. Why do these active sites of enzyme 1 and 2 have different specific shapes? The reason, as we said earlier, is they are proteins, which means that they're made of amino acids. And if you look at the example here, both enzymes are made of amino acids. However, the order of the amino acids is different. And because the order of the amino acids is different, when they fold, they fold into different specific shapes. And then these different specific shapes determine which substrate can fit or bind to the active site of the enzyme. So to summarize, all substrates have got different shapes and so do enzymes. Only the substrates that fit into the enzyme's active site will be able to be catalyzed by that enzyme. The reason why the enzymes have the same specific shape as the substrate is because they're made up of amino acids that fold into that specific shape and they fold into that specific shape because of the order of their amino acids which is different in different proteins. If you heat up a protein such as an enzyme it changes the way the amino acid chain folds and therefore they produce a different shape. This is called denaturing. If enzyme active site denatures that means the substrate will no longer fit into the active site and the enzyme will not be able to catalyze the reaction. Denaturing doesn't just occur in very high temperatures. Changing the pH could also denature the enzyme's active site. When we increase temperature, there is more kinetic energy in particles and that means they move around more. And this is important in, when explaining how temperature is affected by enzyme activity. When you increase the temperature up to the optimum, the rate of reaction or enzyme activity increases. And this is because enzymes and substrates have got more kinetic energy and therefore there will be more successful collisions. And this increases the rate of reaction and the enzyme activity. The highest rate of reaction or enzyme activity is at the optimum temperature, which in this case is 35 degrees Celsius. When you increase the temperature above the optimum, the rate of reaction decreases, and this is because the enzyme's active site denatures and changes shape so that the substrate will no longer fit inside and bind onto the active site. pH and how it affects enzymes. The optimum pH is where the fastest rate of reaction occurs. When you decrease the pH, the rate of reaction or enzyme activity decreases because enzyme active sites denature so that substrates can no longer fit in. When you increase the pH above the optimum, the rate of reaction also decreases and again this is because the enzyme active site denatures and the substrate no longer fits in because the shape of the active site has changed. So to summarize that, any pHs below and above the optimum causes the shape of the active site to change. This means the active site has denatured and the substrate will no longer fit causing the rate of reaction or enzyme activity to decrease. Different enzymes have different optimum temperatures and pH. It's extremely important that you mention that the optimum temperature or pH is the fastest rate of reaction or the highest enzyme activity and you should also state what the optimum temperature or pH is. If they ask about optimum temperature, do not accidentally write optimum pH and vice versa which is a very common mistake in exams. Substrate concentration can also affect the rate of reaction or enzyme activity. When you increase the substrate concentration, the rate of reaction increases. This is because at the beginning, the concentration of substrate concentration is very low. 
and because it's very low that means that there's not a lot of substrates to bind onto the active site of enzymes so the rate of reaction is low when you increase the substrate concentration the rate of reaction increases because there are more substrates available to bind on to the enzyme active site so there's more chance of successful collisions when the rate of reaction is at its highest an increase in substrate concentration has no more additional effect on the rate of reaction and that's because all the enzymes active site are full and you can see this graphically on this image at low concentration there's not enough substrate so the chance of successful collisions is low increasing the substrate concentration increases the chance of successful collisions and therefore the rate of reaction increases and then at the highest concentration all the active sites are full so you cannot increase the rate of reaction it levels off and stays at the same high level of reaction rate or enzyme activity and here is a summary of a model answer for all three effects on enzyme the effect of pH on enzyme activity is a core practical and for this core practical you need to investigate how pH affects enzyme amylase that breaks down starch the reaction is monitored using iodine which is the test for starch the temperature can be maintained using either a Bunsen burner or a water bath here the independent variable is the pH because that is what you are changing and then you are measuring the time taken for the amylase enzyme to break down the starch control variables include the temperature which again as I mentioned earlier can be maintained using the water bath you could also control the substrate concentration and the enzyme concentration for risk assessment because you're using hot water it's extremely important to wear safety goggles so that the hot water or chemicals doesn't get into the eye you could also wear heat resistant gloves this practical works because first you start off with a pH buffer which is something that maintains the pH so it stays constant for example if I use the pH buffer free it means that the pH will always be free and you add starch which is the substrate maintain the temperature using a water bath so I'm using 40 degrees Celsius here and then you have a well containing iodine and iodine is the test for starch so at zero minutes you add amylase which is the enzyme that breaks down starch and because it's at the zero minutes amylase hasn't had time to break down starch there will be starch present and when you add that to iodine the iodine should turn blue black then you do the same thing and you take a sample out again after one minute and if the starch has broken down there will be no more starch present and the iodine will stay orange however if there is starch still present because the amylase hasn't broken down all the starch it will turn blue black you do the same thing after two minutes and then three and so on until you get to a point where all the starch is broken down and when the starch is broken down the iodine will no longer change color and will stay orange so this involves taking out a sample every minute out of the um, test tube which is in the water bath you can then do the experiment again using pH 4 and again you take a sample out at zero minutes and this is when starch hasn't been broken down yet and you continue to do that until you get to the point where you find out how long it takes for the starch to break down where the iodine doesn't change color you can then do it with other pHs to see results and compare the pHs so in this experiment at the beginning the iodine turns blue black and that indicates the presence of starch because amylase hasn't broken it down yet and the experiment ends because amylase has broken down all the starch and so when you add a sample of this to 
So the amylase has broken down all the starch and when you add a sample of this to iodine this means that it stays orange and doesn't change colour. The experiment with the fastest time for iodine to stop changing colour is the optimum pH and this is because all the starch is broken down quicker. So you can see here pH 6 and 7 is the best or the optimum pH because starch broke down within two minutes. You can then put this into a graph and you'll notice that the optimum pH is around 6 and 7. Now in exams you might be asked to calculate the rate of reaction. The rate is how much something changes for instance over time. So it could be change in mass over time or change in volume over time. When you calculate rate always divide the amount by time. So for instance in the example here we've got 100 gram of starch and it was broken down in 5 minutes so it's 100 gram divided by 5 minutes that makes 20 gram per minute. For your unit you should always use the unit of the number that is given so if it's in seconds it will be grams per second instead. If you do not get amount you just divide it by the time. Now when we eat food the food gets digested and gets broken down into smaller molecules. These large molecules in the food when we first eat them are known as polymers and the smaller molecules that they broke down into are called monomers. Example of large food molecules, polymers, are carbohydrates, proteins and lipids. And when they're small enough, i.e. monomers, they can then be absorbed into our bloodstream in the small intestine. Enzymes break down the polymers into monomers. So protein can be broken down into amino acids by the enzyme protease. Starch, such as those found in bread, is first broken down into maltose by amylase, which is an example of a carbohydrate. Maltose can then further be broken down into the monomer glucose. So the monomer for starch is glucose but first is broken down into maltose. All carbohydrates are broken down into sugars using the enzyme carbohydrates. And then lipids can be broken down into fatty acids plus glycerol. This involves the enzyme lipase. Enzymes don't just break things down, they could also join substrates together. So amino acids can be joined together to synthesize protein. Glucose can be joined together to synthesize starch, just like those found in potatoes. You could also join glucose together to produce glycogen and this happens when there is excess glucose in the blood in humans where we store it as glycogen in the liver which you learn in further units. And here is an example. In this example here there is excess blood glucose In paper 2 you learn about how blood glucose is regulated. And if you look at the liver, the liver has enzymes that join the glucose together to form glycogen. So this is an example of how monomers can be joined together to produce polymers. And then fatty acids and glycerol can be joined together to produce lipids. The last topic is transporting substances. In this example of diffusion here involves movement of particles from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. And this happens down a concentration gradient. 
A concentration gradient is the difference between two concentrations in an area. So you can see on the left side there is a higher concentration and on the right side there is a lower concentration. So that means that there is a concentration gradient. And the bigger the difference, the steeper the concentration gradient, the faster the rate of diffusion. So don't forget particles move down a concentration gradient. And here's an example of some concentration gradients and you can see that there is a steeper concentration gradient on the bottom picture and therefore the rate of diffusion is faster. We said earlier that on the outside of cells there is a cell membrane and this cell membrane is partially or semi permeable because it has pores in it that only allows smaller molecules to go through and therefore large molecules can't go through the pores so even though the sugar concentration on the left is higher it can't move through the pores so it cannot diffuse to the right side however the water molecules are small enough to move from one side to the other. So there is a special type of diffusion called osmosis. And in osmosis, water particles move from a higher water concentration to a lower water concentration through the partially permeable membrane. Now if you understand the ideas of solute and solvents, the water will be a solvent so anything dissolved in the water is known as a solute and that forms a solution. When you have pure water, that means the higher water concentration in the water has no solutes and therefore is a lower solute concentration. So the concentration of water is the opposite of the concentration of solutes. So a high water concentration means that there is a lower solute concentration. So another way of explaining osmosis is by saying that it's the movement of water from a lower solute concentration to a higher solute concentration through a partially permeable membrane. And here is an animation showing water moving from a higher water concentration on the left to a lower water concentration on the right. And as I stated earlier, if you have a high water concentration, you have a lower solute concentration. So we could also say that water moves from a lower solute concentration to a higher solute concentration. And don't forget to mention that it's moving through a partially or semi permeable membrane because this gives you an additional mark in the exam. Another core practical is when you're investigating osmosis in potatoes. So here, the question is, what is the sucrose or the solute concentration of potato cells or tissues? And in this investigation involves having a known mass of potato where you add sucrose solution, you leave it for some time, and then you record the final mass and calculate the percentage change in mass. When you leave for time, there will be some exchange of water, so water could either move in, increasing the mass of the potato, or move out of the potato, decreasing the mass of the potato. And through this, you could work out the concentration of sucrose in the potato. To do this experiment, you get your potato, you find out the mass, and then you put them into a range of sucrose solution concentrations. Sometimes the water will move into the potato through osmosis and this will increase the mass of the potato tissue. Here, water moved in from a higher water concentration in the solution to a lower water concentration in the potato cells. And as we stated earlier, a higher water concentration means that there is a lower sucrose concentration. So we could also say that water moved into the potato cells from a lower sucrose concentration in the solution to a higher sucrose concentration in the potato cells. The opposite happens to some of the potato chips. 
Here water moves out by osmosis and this decreases the mass of the potato. The reason why this happens is because there is a higher water concentration in the potato cells and a lower water concentration in the solution. So water moves out of the potato cells. And you could also say that water moves out from a lower sucrose concentration in the potato cells to a higher sucrose concentration in the solution. Now the sucrose concentration of the potato cells can then be determined because you can see where there was a mass gain and a mass loss of the potato chips and the two concentration where there is a difference between the mass gain and the mass loss is the concentration of the sucrose in the potato because that is where there will be no change in mass. So at the end of the experiment you get your potato tissue and you find the final mass using a balancer and then you can work out the percentage change in mass which is the final mass minus the initial mass and you divide that by the initial mass. Notice that some of the percentage change in mass are positive numbers and this is where there was an increase in mass and some of them are negative numbers. This is where there is a decrease in mass of the potato cells. You can then plot this result in a graph. You might have to analyze one for your exam and you can see that as the concentration of solution increases the percentage change in mass decreases. From 0 up to 0 0.46 molar for this result, you can see that there is a percentage gain in mass. And this means that water moved into the, moved from a higher water concentration in the solution to a lower water concentration in the potato tissue, and that is why there was a gain in mass. Above 0 0.46, there was a percentage loss in mass. And this is because water moved from a higher water concentration in the potato cells to a lower water concentration in the sucrose solution. And then the concentration of the sucrose in the potato can be determined here as 0 0.46 molar because this is where there is no gain or loss in mass. So the percentage change in mass is zero. If you get asked a question on the method, you might have to describe how to determine the solute concentration of tissues or cells. You just need to state that you place the tissues or cells in a range of different solute concentrations. You have to measure the mass of the tissues before and after placing them in each of the concentrations. And then you identify the solute concentration where there is no change in mass. And that is the solute concentration of the tissue. The independent variable here is the solute or the sucrose concentration because we place them in different solutions, concentrations. Dependent variable is what we measured and that's the percentage change in mass. It's extremely important you know the control variables because there is a good possibility of them asking you. So here is the time that the potato pieces were left in the solution and also you have to use the same type and size of potato pieces. To reduce error so you could get accurate results, it's extremely important to block the potato pieces before recording its mass. So that means you're only recording the mass of the potato pieces and not any additional water or solution that's on it. And don't forget, you might have to calculate the percentage change in mass, and that's the final mass minus the initial mass, and then you divide that by the initial mass and times by a hundred. So we said earlier that diffusion is the movement of particles from a higher concentration to a lower concentration down a concentration gradient. Osmosis is the movement of water particles from a higher water concentration to a lower water concentration through a partially permeable membrane or a, from a lower solute concentration to a higher solute concentration through a partially permeable membrane. How do minerals get into plant root hair cells? This is because minerals are in a lower concentration in the soil. 
and there is a higher mineral concentration in the root hair cells. So therefore the minerals can't move into the root hair cells by diffusion because diffusion is when particles move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. It doesn't involve osmosis because osmosis is when water particles move. So in this case to move minerals from a lower concentration to a higher concentration you use active transport. So active transport is the movement of particles from a lower concentration to a higher concentration and that means you're moving against the concentration gradient. So we said earlier diffusion is when particles move from a higher concentration to lower down a concentration gradient. Here active transport is when particles move from a lower concentration to a higher concentration against the concentration gradient. An exam question that you get is state the differences between active transport and diffusion structural osmosis. So you can mention that in active transport particles move down a con move against the concentration gradient. In other words, they move from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. Because this happens, that means it requires energy. So you'll tend to find these cells have lots of mitochondria that releases the energy through respiration. And then a final point, you could also mention that they have carrier transport proteins that transport the protein against the concentration gradient. And that is the whole of SB1.